Um, hello, uh, thank you, Alexi. First of all, thank you, the Bartlett, for inviting me here. Um, Alex introduced me as an economist. Um, this is actually what I did, but um, I'm not here to talk to you about uh, this, and I'm not here to talk to you about uh, the business model. Um, of course, or we can talk about this a little later. Um, I'm here to talk to you about um, what, more what we call the creativity design and the massive um, adversity. Um, and uh, I will introduce adversity um, um, to you a little bit. Um, uh, Daphne was so kind to actually give a perfect introduction to MOOCs in general and Lexi too. Um, so I will like, leave this out. I'll talk a little about what we are doing. And then I'll talk about two, two main issues. And that is, um, first, the evaluation of creative assignments in a MOOC, because this is one of the key issues. Um, uh, Daphne already mentioned peer evaluation. I will talk about this a little bit too. Um, but, uh, of course, this is something which uh, needs to be tackled when one wants to do a MOOC um, in a creative area, which um, I believe we're talking about here. And then I'll also present two use cases, um, two courses which run on adversity, um, which I believe are more about, not about so much about like a, a traditional MOOC, but it's about learning something, but it's really about like, the untapped potential that there is. Um, so what else could be done in, in such a setting um, especially when we're talking about the massive and where the massive is not something that hinders one but actually maybe allows for new things. Um, so who are we? We are also, we are a MOOC platform. Um, we are, um, our general idea is, is quite similar to what uh, Daphne's proposed for Coursera. We provide free education. All our content is free. Um, but uh, we also really care about making it count. Um, it was already said how important certificates are for users, um, for students. Um, we believe we are a European platform. Um, we have a focus on Europe. We believe in Europe we have, through the ECTS system, through the um, Bologna reforms and the European higher education area, um, we have a specific system in place which actually allows MOOCs to not only be an add-on and something which you use for your CV and to get a job, but actually something which can be implemented into higher education not to replace higher education in any form, but actually allow for um, what, what Alan said earlier, kind of like to do things which, where it makes sense to do online, online and actually allow instructors to do the face-to-face -face teaching, they spend the time with the face-to-face -face teaching in an improved way and not just doing a lecture to 600, 700 people in an auditorium. And well, this is not what we believe to be um, good teaching world. We don't believe this will be what the future will be. Um, so, who we are, we are located in Berlin, Germany. Um, as of now, we have 25 people. Um, we launched in the, actually our platform in the October of 2013, uh, a little bit later um, uh, than Coursera. Uh, we, of course, are way smaller than Coursera already. Um, we did it in 2013 with a general idea to, um, well, we, we wanted to do MOOCs, and the question was kind of like how to do this. Uh, what we did was we partnered up with the Stifterverband for the Deutsche Wissenschaft, which is one of the largest um, business associations uh, to foster and, 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 and um, finance uh, educational programs. And what we did was we said, well, we don't necessarily care what, where the instructor is from, but we want instructors who are good at teaching. And this is not necessarily always the same. Um, and so we, uh, we set out and, um, and it was called the MOOC Production Fellowship and instructors from all over the world could apply for us with a concept for a MOOC and each received uh, 25,000 um, uh, euros in the end to produce their course actually. Um, and this is kind of how we got started in October. Uh, as of now we have 35 courses, um, we have uh, 450,000 users on our platform. And um, the general goal is to have around 100 courses, 1 million users by the end of the year. Nice round numbers um, to strive for. Uh, we feel we are on a good way. Um, some of our partners. Um, we, for example, we have a partnership with the University of Padua. Um, we have courses by the FETH Aachen or the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, um, uh, the University of uh, Autonoma de Madrid uh, runs the course on our platform. And, and several others. Right now it's around 20, uh, more than 20 universities. And then we have various institutional partners. We have worked with, um, again I said the Stifterverband, uh, we're closely aligned with them, um, but we've worked with various European or national uh, institutional organizations um, because uh, as of right now, I mean, in, in Europe there is a huge movement towards MOOCs. There are a lot of EU programs. Uh, we are part of various of those um, 
to actually kind of like uh, get this um, sort of thing going in Europe. Um, and, and now I want to go kind of like into, into the details and what it's all about. And that for me in, in, in this, in this, um, in this uh, topic of evaluation, um, there is a nice quote, uh, Confucius, which says like, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do understand. Um, I believe everybody who has ever taught or is teaching uh, knows how important um, assignments are and, and the ability of a student to do something to actually um, make them learn something, um, actually get something out of it in the end. Mm. In the MOOC setting, uh, this is quite difficult. Um, uh, how do you actually give feedback and evaluate thousands of creative assignments which are written in such a course? Um, uh, it started out with computer science MOOCs, and there it is easy. You can code. Uh, Daphne showed how, how it is done at Coursera. We have similar um, integration. With us also, you can write a code, and it's evaluated automatically, and um, it works nice and smooth. Uh, how does this work when you write a term paper, when you create a design, which is uh, not just so much about right or wrong? Um, and I mean, for example, right now we have a course on anatomy. It's the same. It's, the, the, the human body doesn't change that much. Uh, the bone is called the same um, anywhere in the world. And it is only right or wrong. It has a specific name. Uh, again, in, in the creative area, it is different. Um, one needs to kind of think about creative ways on how actually allow for evaluation. Um, when it's so more about, in a way, like I like or I don't like, based on the individual expertise of an instructor, and not so much about this right or wrong. Um, I will propose three solutions we are working on right now. Uh, the first one was already proposed, uh, was talked about by, by, by Daphne, um, and, but then I'll propose two different solutions, uh, which we're already testing out right now, and which we believe have a high um, possibility of actually like, improving the situation. Mm. Again, the first one um, was a peer evaluation. Um, the, it, is, it is a pretty simple system of, uh, when, when you move the evaluation from the instructor um, to the students. Uh, it is, uh, from our experience, it is quite difficult um, to actually set this up. It's a like, technical perspective um, as well as for the instructors. Um, uh, but of course, the general idea is simple. You, you, you give them an assignment and you give them scoring criteria. Um, we have, in, on our platform, we have like, several as five uh, evaluations with us at three to seven, um, depending on, on what the instructor ch that chooses. Um, evaluations need to be done. Um, uh, Daphne has already said, talked a little bit about the merits of it, and it is, it is true, it is a great didactic tool. It not only allows the, the, the students to handle an assignment and get feedback, but actually the aspects of having to do those, this feedback and actually having to see different solutions to the same problem. One that was posed to myself to see, okay, I have to solve this and I solved this this way, but he did completely different. So is this good or bad now? Like how, what, what, what can I take away from, from various solutions, but also how do I then now criticize them? How do I evaluate this? Um, it is, it is a, it's a great didactic tool. It is um, a question of does this actually um, work to um, well, hand out uh, university credits, which we are really um, like working hard to have our courses hand out university credits. Um, this, of course, probably is, is, is uh, as of now uh, not possible. Um, we don't have, I haven't found one university yet which said like, well, you have to do final assessment, um, and it's based on peer-to-peer uh, -peer evaluation that is graded, and then you receive actually the student receives the grades from its peers. Um, there are some positive uh, correlations for this. Um, which has been found out between the, the grading of a TA and grading of a peer, uh, but still it is problematic. Um, one thing what <coughs> could be done, possibly, and which we have been trying out with some courses which are in the area of design, is not so much doing it on a level of like, doing defined scoring criteria, but actually then, and, and not having like a few students actually do evaluation, but actually do voting. Because in, in, when it comes to design, there, it, it can be argued that one, one aspect of the quality of a design is if the public likes it, if, it's, if it is like if, if massive amount of people like the design. Um, and if you do this uh, through a smart voting algorithm, actually, you can receive a pretty good idea if, if you have thousands of users in a course, 
so is this actually something that is uh, that there were the public response to? So it is definitely something which um, then also could be part of a, of, of a real grade. It's something which we believe could, in, in terms of um, uh, those those assignments, be be part of of uh, final assessment, uh, which actually hands the credits. Um, the second one I want to talk about is the institutional use of one MOOC at various institutions. Um, this is what, what is happening with one of our courses right now. And there is, you have one MOOC designed by one instructor and with assignments, a final assignment. And, and in this case for us, it is a course which is called a change maker MOOC. It's about um, how to be a social entrepreneur and how to create actually a social project. So the students come in there and um, have the task to create a social project uh, and a project plan in the end. And this course is now used by various institutions in Germany, um, it's a course in German, um, where instructors all over Germany are using this course, using this content, um, and with their own students. So the students still interact inside of this course, so they still have the benefit of the MOOC, um, but they then can be evaluated by the regular instructors and receive regular credits and just have this um, as a working setup. Um, this of course allows for, um, uh, for high quality of, of evaluation. Um, it also allows in a, in a great way for, for, for blended learning, for flip, flipping the classroom. Um, uh, it allows the instructors to, not, to, to tell them, how, look at these videos, look at this content, um, learn how to create a business plan, and then I don't have to tell you in class, but I can actually look at yours, what you are doing, and actually uh, we can improve on this. Um, the problem, of course, that it is, it is more scalable than just one instructor in one MOOC. Of course, it is not as scalable. Um, uh, if, as soon as you're a student and your university doesn't offer it, uh, you're out of the loop. Um, uh, so either you find a lot of universities who do this and maybe then find instructors who say, well, I grade my students plus 20 more or so, um, it, then it could be possible, but still, it's not as scalable. Um, and this is why I want to talk about the last solution which um, we've come up with, and that is called what we call the cloud teaching assistance. It is a solution we believe could be um, going, f uh, going forward, um, something that could be implemented and actually allow for scalability of MOOCs um, when it comes to evaluation. The idea is that in a university setting, in an institutional setting, Rarely uh, are uh, all the assignments graded by the professor of the course, by the instructor. But most often they actually have tutors, they have teaching assistants who do a lot of the grading and do a lot of and reduce the workload immensely for the for the real instructor. Um, and our idea was to well, the, 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 he had, the instructor only has a limited amount of teaching assistants uh, at his at his disposal to do this at a regular setting. But since we also hand out uh, like paid certificates, so we also have a business model where people have to pay for a, for a certificate, there is some money there to actually maybe spend on, on, on grading and scoring something. So what we do is an instructor creates a MOOC with us and creates a final assignment and everything, and then he passes on to us the qualifications that like his regular teaching assistants need. And, and we got, and we did this for a course which was in the area of um, international relations. And we found for this instructor, we had like, after one day, we had 100 applications of, of people who wanted to actually work as a teaching assistant for this instructor and grade this. And then the instructor, we created a shortlist, the instructor picked out a couple of actually, uh, of, of those the cloud teaching assistants that she wanted to use for this. Um, and uh, she gave them those scoring criteria and they actually did the grading for her. And of course, she is, well, they did the scoring. And in the end, she did the grading based on like grading on a curve system, um, which we have in place. So uh, it, it too strongly reduced the the workload for the for the instructor. Um, and uh, of course, the question is, who are those teaching assistants? For some courses, it's easy. If I do a course which is um, in in the like a basic <coughs> course in economics, it still not necessarily can be graded. Uh, by like automatically, but if you have a PhD in, in economics who has some free time and wants to earn a little bit uh, additional money, he or she is probably qualified to grade uh, an introduction to macroeconomics. Um, and, and, and of course there are other uh, topics where it's more difficult. Um, one thing we are thinking about is actually using uh, students who uh, took a class and passed the class 
and then use them as teaching instructor as, as teaching assistants for the next run and kind of like through this uh, have this evolve uh, naturally. Um, you of course need a quality assurance system in place and going to the details is, is complicated but on the general level we believe this actually offers a, a quite an interesting solution for the question of um, creative assignments and how to grading them. Um, and so this is kind of like what we are <laughs> striving towards now. Um, and now I want to talk about something else, and that is what I, again, said, the untapped potential of MOOCs, um, especially when it comes to uh, the massive. Um, I would like to present two courses, um, which took different, uh, uh, had like different concepts, and tried to actually do something different from just, well, I teach 1,000 students or 100,000 students, but actually uh, engage them in a different way. The first course, was uh, Design 101. It was um, by an Italian team. It was uh, Stefano Mitti and um, some other designers um, who uh, wanted to get people to be able to think like a designer. And so they did 101 days long. Uh, they had 101 exercises. Um, but uh, the goal wasn't so much for people to actually achieve something where they say, like, well, now I know this and this and this. But it was really about the individual experience of everybody um, and and the, and this individual experience was for once like doing the assignment on their own, but then exchanging those in the setting of a MOOC and actually engaging them in community activities. And uh, I believe like 50,000 students or so uh, enrolled in this course. Um, in the end, of course, way fewer finished this one. Um, but what they did was in the end they created an exhibition in Berlin at the University of the Arts. Um, the, it was called Blue Flowers. Um, Students from all over the world actually sent them blue flowers. And those came in various forms. Of course, they were artists, so there was a blue arrow, there were a blue blo uh, uh, a broken blue bottle, and, and various forms of installments, which they sent to Berlin. Um, and then the exhibition started, and I believe 70 people from all over the world actually came, those students. So we had people come to, to Berlin from the, from the US, from the UK, from Egypt, from Brazil, just to be there and actually be part of this community. And it wasn't so much for them about what they had actually learned, they all made their personal development in a great way, but for them it was really about the community which they'd formed. And, and now they're really thinking about what to do next. They have this strong community of people who are completely different, who have come from, who have never met each other probably, but who now have like a common ground and have this, this experience behind them to actually now go forward and do something new together. Um, Maybe another move. We had talked to them. Um, so this is a, a, a fascinating course when it comes to just like creating community and, cre and and having community which can do afterwards do something else and bring people together from completely different backgrounds. And the second one was a course which was called Designing Resilient Schools. Um, it was uh, done by two architects, uh, Ivan Shumkov and uh, Dia, um, Ilya Diaz. Um, and the general idea was, uh, Ivan had done a course with us prior, uh, to think about, well, it was in the wake of the typhoon in the Philippines. And uh, Iak is, is from the Philippines and he was actually there. And he, they were thinking about how can we help the situation down there? What can we do to actually help the people in the Philippines? I mean, we are architects, we, and, and, and um, uh, they both um, are, are experts in the field of Brazilian architecture. And, and architecture and, and development world. And they thought, but what can we do now actually to do this? And um, we talked to them and uh, we, we came up with a concept where we said, okay, what we would try to do is you'll teach the basics of Brazilian architecture in, in your class. It's a class which is more or less for, for architects. It is, it is, you need certain background. But if you're like a, um, a, st a master's student in an architecture program, um, you can take part of this. And um, we also invited just general architects as, a, uh, as something to, to learn more, to actually use it as a, like a certificate for their CV, something to just like have a, as a lifelong learning for architects. Um, and um, so, so it was the idea was to how, how uh, and to, to do this like in small groups, have group works, have those people, those work together. Um, on on those projects. And the end hand in actually designs for resilient schools, but those were not just random, but they were actually based on the 
on the uh, material which we received from the Ministry of Education and from various local organizations in the Philippines who told us we need this and this, like we need schools. Schools in, in the Philippines are not only schools, but they're community centers. They are actually shelters in, in the case of typhoons. So, and, and to build those schools, we, um, uh, they are, those are the requirements. We have this material here. We have, the, like the, those, we have this kind of money here. So um, we, we, we took a real world problem and, and put it into a MOOC um, for students to work on this. And that was the first, the, the, like the first level to like, kind of have like, architects work on this class on real life problems. But this is not only this and it was made so, so, so interesting for me. The, 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 the second step was, from my perspective, more interesting is something which really could be interesting in the future. That is, to also invite experts <coughs> in various fields who are not like, in the position to create such a design for the school. Um, but who are still experts in various uh, areas which affect those designs. And what we did was we invited geologists and economists and, and, and people who live in the Philippines to actually help those groups of architects with their program, with their, um, with their projects and their designs. So, and, and from, like, we, we weren't able to do this like, perfectly in the first run, but what I would like to do in the future is to have the ability to for, for groups of, of people to hand in design and then have tech, for example, certain aspects of this with a, like, I need feedback from this, from an expert in this area. And then people, students in the MOOC can still learn on the basic research in the architecture, but also give feedback and actually in, in a way um, uh, can like use their creative energy. I mean, um, uh, Clay Shirky um, coined the term of the cognitive surplus that we have, like, more and more people are uh, want to be active and want to be like creative and actually want to do something. They don't want to sit on the TV anymore, but they actually want to do something. And the internet creates uh, amazing opportunities. And it has been done with various forms of tweet walls and, and, and like in, 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 um, uh, in various um, uh, countries in the world where, for example, um, if there are fights in, in, in Syria right now, you can, yeah, there are platforms where you can see based on tweets by people like what is going on right now and where, the, where there right now is, is um, some altercations. Uh, and what I believe is that MOOCs offer a unique uh, setting to engage this cognitive surplus and engage people from all different backgrounds to actually create something useful and not only allow for learning for, for some, but actually create real life solutions for um, uh, what is happening in the world. And with this, I would like to say thank you. Um, it was a pleasure, and uh, I would like to. I think we have some time for questions, maybe. Anna?